It is nine o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started um, so that we can get all of our presenters on with their day. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick um, housekeeping. Everybody, I think, joined on mute, um, but if you have any questions, I'm going to try to keep my eyes on the, uh, the participants. So raise your hand or ask your question in the chat window. And then after each presentation, you can ask your questions. Um, most of you have already done it, but go ahead and sign in by typing your name and agency in the chat window. And then as usual, I will make this presentation available on the TRA YouTube channel. Um, with the approval of all the presenters, I will include their, their presentations as well. Um, so it'll be on that channel uh, within a week or so. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in with uh, Eva Steinley Darling's presentation on PFAS. Um, as many of you know, this is a, a, an issue that's of great interest and concern all over the world. This is a little infographic that I found on the City of Riverside's YouTube, uh, website that shows it's just about in everything. Um, so she, Eva is going to present on the PFAS study that was conducted in the Trinity Basin um, early last year, I believe. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up her presentation. While Angela does this, I want to uh, extend a very big thank you. We have a little bit of night tired show this morning in the hotel room and that hotel and evidently the entire area are the internet is down. Uh, thankfully, my cell phone is on a different uh, provider, so I was able to get the slides to Angela, um, but I'm walking off a cell phone hotspot right now, so hopefully this will work. Um, in any case, um, thanks for bringing up those slides, Angela. Uh, did you want to say anything else or should I get going? Um, I think everything's uh, good on my end. You can see the slides and everything looks good. I can. This is great. Thank you so much. All right. Just tell me when to advance and I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. All right. Thank you, Angela. So I, um, I want to preface this by saying I included a few more slides than I really intend to present. Some of them you may have seen before at a previous uh, compact meeting. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to skip through the slides pretty quickly. This is the second presentation and it's really the wrap up presentation. We are now done with this study, um, both uh, the overall Water Research Foundation study as well as uh, the, the Trinity River portion of it. Um, so, um, Angela, let's go to the next slide. Uh, some of this is now uh, pretty obviously um, and the next slide, please. So this first section I included really for reference. Uh, I think there's one more click on this slide. The point being here is that PFAS are everywhere. The last time I presented this slide, I had references for them being found atop Mount Everest in the North Pole. Since then, there's been another paper, and unfortunately I couldn't find the reference on short notice, but they also found it at the South Pole, so I added our little penguin. Um, it's just to illustrate really they are everywhere, building on what Angela said a minute ago with her little infographic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and PFAS are also a very big family of compounds. So it, the, you know, I, I refer to this as the, the four letter word in our uh, internally in Corolla. Um, and there are, are, there are acronyms galore. Um, so the, the important thing to know is if it starts with a PF, it's probably uh, a PFAS, um, although there are many others now too. This little family tree I'm showing on the slide here shows, um, you know, the the whole, you know, the whole grouping of PFAS at, at the trunk. And actually, the vast majority of those 10,000 go off to the left in the precursor category, the polyfluoroalkyls. Those are um, those are typically used. What is used in um, consumer products and all of those things that you saw in the previous slide. But what we measure is that other branch on the right hand side, those are the breakdown products. Those are the for actual forever chemicals, the ones that are so difficult to break down. And those break down into various categories that I, I don't really want to get into today, but it's there for your reference and you're welcome to reach out with questions if you have any. Next slide, please. Um, so what's new since the last time we talked, I think this has been on everybody's minds, is the proposed MCLs. Uh, in drinking water for uh, actually three MCLs for six compounds. Go go 
wrap your brain around that. And so I just wanted to point out that's that's a complicated thing. Two of those MCLs are what we kind of the kind of structure we expect. There's a compound PFOA with a limit for four nanograms per liter or parts per trillion. That's already unprecedented. PFOS is another of those compounds, and it has a specific limit. And then this third MCL is actually more complicated. It's called a hazard index, and it's calculated from uh, the concentrations of four additional PFAS, uh, two of which are considered short chain. Um, and what's really important here is the reference concentrations shown in the denominators of those fractions. So where we have uh, low numbers, um, the, you know, the first three of those, the nine parts per trillion, ten parts per trillion, and ten parts per trillion, respectively, that's where, you know, that fraction gets pretty big pretty quick. And if you have to stay below one, that can be a challenge. Um, again, I'm also happy to share the fact sheet where some of this is explained uh, that we put together. Uh, so let's move on now. One more next slide. Actually, it's just a, a build, I think. So um, compliance um, window for that, you know, this is what is supposed to happen, uh, supposed to finish, uh, finalize the rule in 2023. The EPA has been behind on every one of their milestones so far, but they have moved on, moved along this pathway. So I do expect that we will have enforceable MCLs um, announced by the end of this year or maybe early next year. Um, there'll be a three year uh, formal compliance window, um, 26, 27, maybe, um, and there is the opportunity for a 2 year extension, which I, which I expect a lot of uh, water systems will be looking towards that are affected by this. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, you may be aware that the EPA plans on taking actions on PFAS beyond drinking water. They have a whole PFAS action plan. I just want to reference it here and then move on because we do want to get to the results of the study specifically. Next slide, please. Um, so this the sec second section um, is really all about motivation for the study, and that's that treatment for PFAS is really hard and expensive um, is the takeaway. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, based on just the UCMR3 monitoring results, so that's from 2013 to 2015, those were collected. EPA expects about 66,000 public water systems to be subject to the rule and, you know, a good 10% of them are anticipated to exceed one or more MCLs. I think that's a low estimate um, and some of the work that we've done will show you why. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our best available technologies for water treatment for PFAS, and I put drinking in parentheses, of course, drinking water treatment is, is, is going to be the first um, place where that's necessary, but um, these are all also um, probably the most viable options for uh, wastewater treatment, advanced treatment. So we're talking granular activated carbon absorption, ion exchange, which is really similar in terms of the mechanisms that are actually at play. We're not talking about regenerable resins here. That's really exhausted as well. Uh, other novel sorbents, there are a few that have been, there are a lot have been tried and there are a few that look pretty uh, promising. And then uh, good old standby uh, desalination membranes, right? If you really need a big hammer, uh, those are those are effective as well. Um, all of these are expensive, both in their uh, capital, um, especially RO, but then the operations, um, especially media changeouts, are uh, really expensive as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so, based on UCMR three data. Uh, the AWWA uh, developed a cost model looking at uh, US wide treatment cost estimates. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars uh, needed to implement treatment at the level that um, they're estimating just based on that, those old data points. That's an annual cost of five to six billion. Uh, again, I think that's low, um, and that's because uh, UCMR5, which is coming up now, and, and many of uh, the um, you know, water utilities are, are partway through that uh, sampling already is going to show that more water systems are affected than the EPA originally um, thought. So next slide, please. Um, so here's where we really get to the meat of this study. Um, and, it, and it's really all about looking at what are your other options before you um, go down the treatment rabbit hole. Uh, let's, let's really understand the source and and how we can deal with uh, challenges there rather than um, dealing with with the problem and kind of end of pipe, if you will. So next slide, please. 
Um, so we, we know that major PFAS sources to water systems include industrial sites, military fire training areas and airports. Um, and so this is a, this is a graphic on the left of your slide. It's very, um, it's, it's non quantitative other than to say that, you know, specific in industries, um, PFAS producing industries obviously will have some of the most, the highest concentrations of discharge, but there are very few of them total. If you look kind of nationwide and even basin wide, which is of what you're of interest here, um, uh, you know, you go down uh, up this graph to the top and left, and the concentrations discharged by these different sources uh, decrease, but the numbers of those sources increase. And so, you know, we're showing wastewater treatment plants as um, sites, and then we've listed this as sites, not sources, specifically because even though we know that all wastewater treatment plants have PFAS in their treated water. We also know that wastewater treatment plants are not the source of those PFAS, right? And to keep in mind and that keep it all in perspective, even rain contains PFAS. And when you're looking at contributions to a large surface water body and you're trying to close that mass balance, that actually matters a little bit. Um, the other thing is because they're everywhere, it's really challenging to link PFAS to an ultimate source. Although um, there are a number of lawsuits ongoing now trying to um, go beyond just the, I know that you discharged this particular compound at this particular point, and it's, you know, it, it's a problem for my drinking water, so I'm going to sue you. Now we're really starting to see lawsuits where they're going, well, we know you manufactured this stuff. You manufactured it over many decades. You knew that it was problematic. You didn't tell anybody, so we're going to sue you about that. That's a very different, you know, level of of uh, proof that that needs to be provided um, to be able to be successful there. So, you know, we'll see how that moves forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I want to point out, and I don't want to go into detail in this graphic, but PFAS is truly a one water problem. So we have a lot of uh, different water systems, and this is how we broke down the world of water in this study is to look at sources to wastewater treatment plants sources to drip groundwater and sources to drinking water. And of course, all of those are connected and that's what these arrows show. Um, and that's a lot of the sampling that we did, not just within the uh, Trinity Basin, but uh, uh, other places as well, including a lot of sources to wastewater. So the actual collection system sampling uh, were, was done with the idea of kind of understanding this picture as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just in summary, and you've seen this graphic before, the idea was to provide utilities with practical, implementable, and cost-effective guidance on PFAS source evaluation and mitigation strategies. In this project and the final report that we just submitted, the draft final to the foundation, there is a little bit on treatment and costs as well, but the focus is really trying to figure out how do we deal with it upstream. Um, and so we did a number of case studies. We did uh, sampling in three different parts of the water universe in wastewater, surface water, and groundwater and ultimately develop guidance um, that is, you know, goes beyond the, you know, several hundred page research report, which um, nobody's going to read, let's be honest, um, and and provides sort of a, uh, an executive, an expanded executive summary that really tells people what they need to know in terms of understanding their upstream sources of PFAS and what to do about the problem. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to summarize a lot of these uh, findings very quickly, and again, happy to entertain questions afterwards or offline. Uh, the one graph I wanted to show on looking at sources to wastewater, so this is within the collection systems, um, and this was done by our partners on the project at CDM Smith, along with uh, help from uh, Linda Lee at Purdue, who did a lot of the analysis. Um, and uh, this is looking at all the different potential um, industrial and commercial categories of contributions to four different sewer, large sewer sheds that they sampled across the US. Um, and note this is on a log scale. So even small differences in your in your bars actually represent really big differences. And the little numbers on top of the graphs show how many of this category were sampled as part of this, this kind of uh, four collection system case study approach. And the thing I want you to notice is the total bar is on the left. That's the influent wastewater on average um, to those five different wastewater treatment plants that were looked at. And the domestic wastewater, the total mass flow um, to those wastewater treatment plants, the, the largest contribution 
by an order of magnitude, if you sum over all of them, is domestic wastewater. So it's not the electronics companies, it's not the landfills, it's not the cliche, it's not the airports, although those all have smaller flow contributions and much higher concentrations, and so they're easy picking to bring down your, your concentrations. The bulk of PFAS coming to wastewater treatment plants uh, uh, you know, written broadly is actually from domestic sources, for, so from people's use of everyday items, and that was a big takeaway for us. It makes makes this problem a lot more challenging to to try and um, manage, right? Uh, so next slide. Um, I think there's no surprise here that looking at groundwater sources, landfills are very frequent sources of contamination. This is looking at a national database, and I always forget what the SSCHRI stands for. You can Google it. Um, the, the, go the Google result is correct. Um, and then you compare this to the state of Michigan, which did a lot of work early on uh, with PFAS. You see landfills are you know, over a third of the total sources of PFAS to groundwater. And then only then do we have industrial sources, military sources, et cetera. Um, so again, the takeaway is the use of our everyday objects, right? Our, 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 all of our, our uses of commercial products, in this case, the stuff we send to landfills, is, is one of the biggest challenges that we have with PFAS. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the things that I found very interesting and, and you know, a little bit scary here is looking at um, PFAS in groundwater across the state of Michigan, and they had two data sets. One was from UCMR3. Again, this is this is uh, you know nationwide sampling, but the data we're showing here is limited to the samples collected in Michigan versus the sampling they did in 2018. Um, and I'm just showing uh, detection frequencies for large and small uh, water systems that are uh, ground based on groundwater. And you can see the 2018 numbers uh, detections are significantly higher. Um, and that's even though we kind of tried to make it apples and apples and use the same method reporting limits. So we basically artificially filtered the newer data to not count anything that was below the detection limits that they used in UCMR3. So they're, they're apples to apples and you can see those concentrations are going up. So to me, that means, a, 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 you know, the contact contamination we're seeing in groundwater is still expanding. Those plumes are still growing um, and it's a problem we're going to have to continue to deal with over time. Um, Next slide, please. So finally, I think the, the thing that everybody here is actually on the call to hear about, um, I'm going to use the Trinity case study as an exemplar of what we did to look at sources to surface water. Uh, we also did several other detailed case studies, including one in the Las Vegas wash and the uh, city of Ann Arbor um, in Michigan that had some uh, very interesting upstream source mitigation story. Um, so if you want to hear about that, reach, reach out to me online. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is a summary of uh, the sampling that we did. Uh, we sampled at 12 sites along the Trinity for PFAS and for sucralose. Uh, you'll see that two of those sites are labeled in green and they have, you know, they, they were obviously slotted in. We did two sets of sampling, one in January um, of 2022, I guess. I'm starting to lose track of time, and one in August. So one set of samples was really intended to be kind of average or maybe even higher flow conditions, and the other was really focused on, on low flow conditions where we would be, uh, we would have a higher percentage of effluent in the, in the Trinity. Um, so these are the sites. Uh, you can see site 3A and site 4A were really selected to close gaps that we had along the Trinity, so we have a more consistent set of sampling locations along the river over time. Uh, next slide. So you might be asking yourself, why sucralose? This whole presentation is about PFAS, right? Um, and the reason we chose sucralose in addition to PFAS is that it's a, the ideal wastewater effluent tracer. It's non-toxic, right? It's in all of our diet sodas, et cetera. It's highly persistent in wastewater treatment in the environment um, because it's designed not to break down. Um, we have we see high concentrations in wastewater effluent because people love their diet sodas. Um, and those concentrations are very consistent among different wastewater treatment plants. So uh, this graphic I'm showing below is from utilities across the country 
um, and data collected over time. And you can see there's a little bit of an upward trend. So sucralose is starting to replace some of the older uh, artificial sweeteners, but we still have a pretty good reference uh, at, at any point in time of uh, how much sucralose is in wastewater. And therefore, if we measure it in surface water, we have a pretty good idea of how much wastewater effluent uh, went into that surface water at some point. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so here are the results. These are the ones uh, for the summer. I intended to put the uh, the uh, uh, January samples up there as well, uh, but given all the IT challenges, I wasn't able to update these slides, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, we do have data for both of those, uh, but what you're seeing here is a stacked bar graph. This is now not on a on a log scale, so it's a very a linear scale the way you would expect it by site for all the PFAS that were detected. Uh, so we measured more than, than what's shown here, but we're showing only the ones that are detected. You can see on the legend to the right, I have them in the order um, that they are stacked in the graph. Uh, the ones with the little asterisks are uh, either have a proposed MCL or are part of this hazard index calculation for the proposed MCL. Uh, and those of you who are very familiar may notice, and that's the double asterisk note on this slide, uh, we don't show Gen X, um, and that's because we did not detect Gen X in any of the samples. So that's a good, that's good news, right? Um, but you'll note as a general trend site, starting with site 3A, which is downstream, just downstream of the Metroplex, that's when our, um, our concentrations peak, and then as, we flow downstream and get dilution from the wetter uh, part of the, the basin, those concentrations come back down. Um, so this is uh, more or less what we expected. Obviously, we didn't know what, what scale we would see them at, um, and, um, but a very, a very consistent result for, for the purposes of our study. And I think important also for uh, the folks on this call to kind of dig into those numbers a little bit and understand what that might mean for um, folks that use the water uh, down in the future. So next slide, please. So a major takeaway that was important, not just for our study, um, but I think for the idea of controlling the sources and understanding what, what next steps to take, uh, even if they're kind of a challenge, is to realize that we looked, because we looked at sucralose, um, the sum of the PFAS correlate very strongly with the sucralose in the river. Um, and so that was both for wet weather sampling, and you can see that's down towards the bottom of the graph because concentrations of both sucralose and PFAS were lower there because we had more dilution for precipitation. Um, and the dry weather sampling in August, uh, where we had some pretty high, higher concentrations of PFAS, um, but those also correlate with higher concentrations of sucralose. So, uh, the takeaway from this is uh, writ large within the basin is the PFAS entered the river via municipal wastewater discharges, and um, we're not looking for any major industrial discharges um, specifically to the river that would have thrown this correlation out of whack. Um, so that's you know, uh, so that so that's a major takeaway from from our findings here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I. I Think it's important and I present this uh, whenever I present these data. One more back there. Thanks, Angela. Um, you're starting to anticipate my my slide transitions. I appreciate that. The Trinity is obviously not the only river with this issue. This is a graphic from uh, a seminal paper in the field of water reuse looking at um, the percentage of effluent in surface waters across the country. We call that uh, de facto reuse. And, and uh, you know, the Trinity is not even close um to the most uh, uh you know the highest numbers on here <laughs> the rio grande the mouth of the rio grande is pretty much the poster child there this is under average flow conditions so the august data that we have uh would be would show higher percentages than what you're seeing on this map but it's just to show even all across the east we have pretty significant concentrations of uh, effluent in our surface water bodies, and we have to recognize that. And, and I think PFAS is the is the water quality challenge that's really going to push us to recognize that. Um, you know, beyond the the reuse nerd circles that I that I spend my time in. Um, next slide, please. So I, I did want to end on a, a little bit of good news. Um, the uh, the PFAS that is most 
controlling in terms of what might uh, create issues from an MCL perspective on the surface water discharges from what the data we've seen is PFOA, and that's true in the Trin Trinity as well. Um, what I'm showing here is a, a review of wastewater treatment F or what the wastewater effluent data across the US, um, uh, kind of a meta analysis done over two decades by uh, my colleague Kyle Thompson, who's still on parental leave, so I'm still giving these updates. Um, and note that this graph is on a log scale. Um, so we've seen substantial concentrations of PFOA. Um, substantial decreases in concentrations of PFOA in wastewater effluent over the last two decades. Um, and, you know, if these MCLs had come out in 2000, we would have had a big problem. Um, and now we're kind of at the pro at the part at the point where we're on the cusp, right? Where small changes, small additional decreases in these concentrations over time, if we can continue this trend, uh, will actually have a major impact on how much um, treatment is going to need to be happen on our impacted surface water bodies. Uh, so next slide. So, you know, where do I begin? Maybe the next question, and I only have one slide here. I know I've taken probably more than my allotted time. Um, so uh, the 5082 guidance, which will be published within a couple months, but I'm also happy to share a draft version ahead of time if I can get permission from the foundation. Um, is really the place to start. Next slide, Angela. Uh, that guidebook lays out step-by-step -step process in really two major sections. Uh, one is to find your sources of PFAS, um, gives you guidance on monitoring, source identification, sampling guidance, which can be a bear. Um, the, the TRA sampling uh, teams know, know this. Um, and then also interpreting and confirming the results, not conforming, sorry, that's a typo. Um, and then the, the, the last few chapters focus on mitigating those issues, and, and there's a section on, you know, managing those from a technical perspective through source control and really treating treatment as a last resort. But then this last one, and we put that in the middle of the circle intentionally because it's, it's something you need to do uh, throughout. Uh, as soon as you know you have an issue, right, there's the policy and communication aspects. Uh, recognizing that water and wastewater utilities are not an original source of PFAS. Um, that it's going to take consumer education, um, bans of PFAS and cons certain consumer products like, uh, you know, we probably want to continue to have Teflon coating on our medical implants because we don't have a better material for that. But does it really need to be in my makeup? Probably not. Um, and so those are some of the things that we need to grapple with as a, as a society to understand where, where do we need this chemistry and where is it maybe best left alone now that we know all about the toxicology of it. Um, and so, you know, not using it anymore is the ultimate source control strategy. Uh, next slide. So I want to uh, flash up our acknowledgement slide, but then I think I have one more animation here, An Angela, to, to put a little box around the, the helpers we had for the sampling on the Trinity. Uh, I do want to specifically uh, thank Webb and Angela uh, for their leadership on this portion of the study. They did all the, they coordinated with their sampling teams, did all the sampling. We just shipped them coolers and and they, you know, they went, went out in their boats and collected those samples over the courses, course of three consecutive days for each sample event. So we had triplicates, um, a big, big sampling effort. And I really appreciate it. Um, also want to shout out to the city of Fort, Fort Worth because we did sample both at the TRA's uh, cruise wastewater plant as well as the Village Creek. Um, facility um, and I want to make sure that those folks get acknowledged as, as well. Um, so with that, I think uh, last slide, please, Angela. Um, uh, we'll probably defer questions since I've taken up a lot of time, um, but I did want, since this is probably my last presentation to this group, I wanted to make sure that we presented all the information that was relevant and you're welcome to reach out to me at the email address shown in the slide. All right, thank you. Um, well, so far I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but we have time for maybe a couple. Going once, going twice. Thanks, Elena. I saw your chat message. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Eva. I really, really appreciate you getting getting this one done. I know we've had some tech gremlins already this morning, so I appreciate it.
Yeah, I'm sorry. I saw that the chat message is floating by as it's presenting. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for the folks who are unable to um, see this live, but I do encourage you if you're listening to this in a recording to reach out via email and ask your questions that way. Okay. Thanks, Chet. I appreciate your comment as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. Bye. All right. So, um, Next up, we have Heather. She is going to be presenting on <clears throat> TRA's implementation plans for the watershed protection plans we've been working on. And let me see, Heather, are you? All right, can everybody see her slides? Can you hear me? I can hear you a little bit. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Okay, we see slides. Perfect. Okay. All right, Heather, take it away. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Good morning. So I am watershed scientist for Trinity River Authority under the Water Resource Planning Group. And I'm here to talk about the watershed protection planning that we have done and our implementation updates for the associated watersheds. So first up, I'm going to talk about our Joe Cool Lake Watershed Protection Plan. Uh, it was funded uh, by the TCEQ through Clean Water Act Section 319 from the EPA with local match funding from TRA and the cities of Cedar Hill, Grand Prairie, Mansfield, and Lothian. So the impetus for this project stemmed from the 2014 Texas Integrative Report, and it listed Walnut Creek as impaired for E. coli and Mountain Creek arm of Joe Lake has a concern for nitrates. So the Walnut Creek, um, it exceeded the criteria of the 126 most probable number for 100 milliliters at 195.6 and Mountain Creek exceeded the nitrate screening level of 0 0.37 milligrams per liter at 0 0.74. So the goals of this project, it included protecting water quality in Jopal Lake, as well as the tributaries and improving water quality by addressing the nitrate concern in the lake and the bacteria impairment in Walnut Creek. So as of 2018, Walnut Creek had been delisted. However, limited data precluded the full assessment of Walnut Creek in the 2022 Texas Integrated Report, and it has been listed as a concern for bacteria. Mountain Creek has also been removed as a nutrient concern. So our results from our SWOT analysis, uh, sorry, our select analysis um, revealed what you see on the map. So we have a relative severity of E. coli loads from all sources in these sub watersheds. So the overall impacts, they appear to be most prevalent in the urban, most urbanized area of the watershed, which is this north northern portion and it's um, predominantly from pet waste uh, the western sub, sub watersheds of walnut creek they also had high loadings from deer and livestock and these values uh, were the high the values of the high load high loading were well below the 126 allowable loading so it didn't have a large contribution to the total loading and then we also found septic facilities. Those also supplied a high to moderate um, loads in the south. And um, our wastewater treatment facilities, those also contributed to overall E. coli loading, but only in regions where they were located. So you can access our report on our website. All right, so our watershed protection plan, it was submitted to the EPA in August of 2022, and it was accepted in October 2022. So it is now eligible for Clean Water Section Act, oh my God, Clean Water Act Section 319 funding for watershed implementation projects outlined within the plan. So for our management measures that we identified, we anticipate if we implement everything that the load reduction for E. coli uh, would be reduced by 3.4 times 10 to the 15th per year. And that is going to exceed the needed reductions of 2.42 times 10 to the 15th. The anticipated nutrient load reductions would be 1.86 times 10 to the one ton per year. 
So I'm not going to go through the management measures identified, but um, uh, one to highlight is going to be our septic facilities. So these were these management measures were identified in this one, and then Bill of Creek, which I will talk about. Okay, so since um, Joe Lake was accepted by the EPA, we have formed an inter interlocal agreement with the city of Grand Prairie, Cedar Hill, Mansfield, Midlothian, as well as ourselves, and it uh, has gone into place and it will run from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 27. And so uh, this has been started in order to implement pollutant reduction strategies that were identified and the partners agreed that a regular shared funding mechanism is needed. And so whenever possible, these funds will be used as match funds for federal grant dollars that will target these programs. So we're hoping to apply for um, 60 federal 40 local match splits on different grants. So it'll be a five-year total budget, each partner 10,000. And so we're hoping, or we will have a total contribution of 250,000 to be able to apply for um, a large grant in the future. All right, so switching over. So please provide you an update for the Village Creek Lake Arlington Watershed Protection Plan. So this was approved by the EPA in 2019. So just a refresher, Lake Arlington, it borders Fort Worth on the west side, Arlington on the east side. It provides drinking water and recreation. We know it's rapidly developing. Uh, it is listed for nutrient concerns, nitrate and chlorophyll A. Downstream, you have Village Creek and its associated tributaries that flow into Lake Arlington. So Village Creek is to the south, flows into Lake Arlington in the north. And Village Creek is impaired for E. coli. Uh, multiple municipalities and local authorities were involved in the development of the Watershed Protection Plan. So most of you probably know, but uh, we, as we, since we had identified illegal dumping and litter accumulation in this Watershed Protection Plan, uh, and stakeholders had identified um, best management practices to attack this, um, and they noted. Uh, expanding litter cleanup events, and then also continue uh, development of illegal dumping and refuse accumulation surveys. We were able to apply for a litter abatement grant through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Five Star and Urban Waters Restoration Program, and so this was able to fund the purchase the purchase of water goats, which is a litter abatement device that you can see right in the photo, um, and. We were able to get support from Tarrant Regional Water District, uh, Upspire, City of Fort Worth, uh, University of Texas at Arlington, and the grant is through uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation down here. So Upspire um, is the reason this grant has been successful because they are uh, responsible for the maintenance of these barriers. So they go out and clean up every two weeks or within three days after a rainstorm. So we've been able to help expand the Upspire Waterways Litter Prevention Program, and they were actually able to um, get a larger contract now with the City of Fort Worth to um, do these cleanups, essentially hire more people um, to go out and do that. Uh, the project kicked off in February of 2022, and we have 10 sites throughout Fort Worth. So TRA, you go out monthly and do a litter survey, and then Upspire heads out and cleans up the sites. Uh, we will conclude this project in July of 2023, and City of Fort Worth will be taking ownership of the water goats, and they have the contract with Upspire in place who will continue to clean the sites as needed. The sites will probably change as Fort Worth sees fit. We were published in the Fort Worth Report last year. It's a great article if you guys are interested in accessing it and sharing it with uh, your colleagues. We have created flyers to promote this project. You can scan the QR code and go to our project website. And then um, UTA, who is our key outreach and education partner, they repurposed the flyer we made so that that they could use it for their cleanup events. This one was specifically for an event we held 
this past Saturday, um, Earth Day, and um, they went out and collected at least 40 bags of trash, a bunch of tires, uh, an insert to a car door, um, a kid's playhouse. It, there was a lot. So I'm still waiting for the exact numbers from the city of Fort Worth, but it was a lot of pounds. And then Webb and I were in the water and we were scooping up trash and bringing it to the bank for the students to pack up. It was a good Saturday. All right, so life to date, uh, weight collected. We, since, so we started project February, since we installed in May of 2022, we have collected 13,200 pounds just with this uh, TRA project of the 10 sites. So very impressive. We've definitely run into um, difficulties with the goats. So we've had to move them around just based on flow or um, like scouring or vandalism, but or lack of trash, which is not a bad thing. So um, we have put, in, uh, put them in at different sites, but you can access our website and check out the map and the live updates. All right, I think that's it on the water goat. Oh, yeah. We will have, uh, so for Village Creek, we're gonna be having an upcoming workshop through Texas a and Texas Watershed Steward event, and it will be with the city of Burleson at their Russell Farm Arts Center. Registration will be required. It will be free to attend and we will be Uh, lastly, we have uh, been awarded a 319 grant from TCEQ to jointly support our village, Creek Lake Arlington, and Joe Plan. So this will be starting September 1 and running through uh, fiscal year 25. And this will be looking at septic facilities in four counties. Johnson, Tarrant, Ellis, and Dallas, and we'll be looking at creating a database and supporting the rehab or um, new install of subject facilities where they are failing. So this is our project map. So Village Creek on the left, Joe Pool on the right. And uh, Texas A&M is our contractor for this project. So Texas A&M, Extension and research. So both arms are going to be supporting us on this. We will be working with the COG heavily as well as the cities that are listed below on the slide to build a um, OSSF database. I did this OSSF uh, database and we'll inventory those subject facilities. We will come up with a ranking criteria for subject facilities, um, come up with a program application for residents. Um, we will hopefully be able to inspect, repair, and or replace up to 10 failing subject facilities. And then we'll also host education programs of subject facilities within the watershed. So if you have any contacts with your DRs in your areas or in our area for Dallas, Johnson, and Tarrant, and Ellis, please send them my way. DRs are your designated reps that are licensed to go out and inspect and inspect. So, so funding um, total that we'll be receiving, or total for the contract is uh, for $100,777, uh, $179. Our match is coming from TRA in-kind, as well as Texas A&M Extension and Texas A&M Research, and the federal uh, will be 286307 So we're looking forward to working on this. Woohoo! All right, and that's that. Here are our websites. And I uh, I know questions popped up, but I couldn't see them. They're a little distracting. So please let me know, Angela, if there's questions. I don't know where. Chat. Here we go. Bill, are you there? Happened. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Uh, 
All right, a link for the article. Yes, I can do that. Hit, and I will drop it. All right, it is going to be, where'd it go? Web. There you go. So, if are there any questions? All right. Well, thanks for having me. Have a good rest of your day. That was super interesting. I don't know if anybody else has their mute buttons on, but uh, just wanted to say I heard it and I saw it and it was really cool. So thanks. David, are you up next? I think so. Okay. Let's do a quick I sound check. I don't check. know where Angela went. Can you all hear me? I can yep. hear you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I don't know where Angela went either. I don't mind just starting on the fly. Here I am. There you are. <laughs> I preemptively muted. I am so sorry. So, Dave, you should have control of the presentation now. You should be able to share your screen. Screen two. Let's see how the gremlins work on my side. I see it. Yes. Okay. Is it the one that's you're seeing the one that's advancing that's actually the screen, not any notes or anything? I correct. I see the presentation screen. Okay, good deal. I'm sorry, I was gonna introduce it. I think I've muted myself too early. So Dave Cowan is with North Texas Municipal Water District. So he's gonna be presenting on some non-standard projects for waste watershed protection plans, correct? Yeah, specifically on uh, a spill response tool that we developed. Um, uh, over the last few years with Plumber. Or the Lebon watershed. You didn't talk about how long we've known each other, Angela. I guess maybe that's ancillary. Um, I think Way I've known long. you since the day I started working here. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 something years. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Angela said, my name is Dave Callen. I uh, am watershed manager for the North Texas Municipal Water District. And yeah, today I do want to talk a little bit about, I guess, a, a non-traditional project, but I think it's a cool project. When we were talking about potential updates, uh, the Lebon Watershed Pro Protection Plan has been going on since it was approved by uh, by EPA in 20, um, 2018. And so it's, it's been ongoing and is standard operating procedure, but I thought this one was a little bit more exciting uh, from, from our standpoint anyway, because it is sort of some out of the box thinking um, and ways to protect uh, water quality in the watershed. So I do wanna give a shout out uh, prior to starting to Plumber, and in particular, Ernest Toe, who's a modeler for Plumber, who did a lot of the heavy lifting on this. This, this presentation, is in large part a presentation that he and I both gave down at Texas Water last year. <clears throat> a little background about the district, looking at the attendees, this is probably old hat, but just in case there's some folks that are not familiar with the district, um, we are a wholesale water, uh, wastewater, and solid waste provider. Uh, located in Wiley, Texas, we started in the 50s when about 10 cities got together realizing there wasn't enough water in the region to supply a growing, um, those growing cities. 
And so today that's grown into, um, as I mentioned, the uh, water, wastewater, solid waste services for uh, over 40 member and customer cities. So we serve a 10 county area and that, that area is seen shaded in the map here. Um, our, our primary source of water is Levon Lake, but we all also get water from Texoma, Chapman. Can you guys, is there a way to, boarding in progress, is there like a red dot? Y'all can't see my, my arrow on this screen, can you? Yes, I can. Oh, you can, cool, okay. So uh, Texoma, Chapman, uh, Tawakonee, we also get water through our, our constructed wetland down on the East Fork of the Trinity River, which is, it pumps water from the main stem of the Trinity as well as East Fork. And then also uh, Bodark Lake, which just came online uh, last month, as a matter of fact. So the, all those supply water, but Levon is sort of the mothership for the district. We provide water to over uh, 2 million people within those member and customer cities and the total capacity of our plants, there are six plants, four of them here in Wiley um, and the remainder uh, throughout the, the, the area is 910 million gallons. Just for some geographical perspective, uh, the, the watershed is in sort of that upper right hand, uh, upper east pocket of the Trinity River. Um, the, the watershed itself can be divided into um, five sub watersheds, I'll say, but the primary one is the East Fork uh, of the Trinity River, which I mentioned earlier, which uh, flows directly down into the, the Trinity River. The watershed itself is about 492,000 acres. Uh, it, it encompasses or Collin County is part of, it is primarily part of Collin County. I don't know if that makes sense or not, uh, which is the sixth most populous county in the state and is, as everyone is aware in the North Texas region, very, very rapidly urbanizing area. You can see some population projections down there from the regional water plan, uh, from the state water plan and going out to uh, 2070 you know, that, that population is going to double. And so more people means um, more traffic, more highways, more rail cars, more things that could potentially cause uh, catastrophic spills. And so while the district has and manages a watershed protection plan, we are also uh, participants in TCEQ source water protection program. Those are mechanisms that reach out to the public and uh, we can inventory potential sources of pollution. We can also uh, help prevent non-point source pollution, but they do not inherently address um, catastrophic spills. So this is our, our sort of way of handling that. So in 2018, the district contracted with, uh, with Plummer, as I mentioned, and Plummer had been developing uh, a couple of models. We used SWAT and CEQUAL2 um, what Plummer did was they, they coupled those two models together. So SWAT is a watershed scale model. And then um, C equal to B2 is, is more of a two-dimensional um, uh, model that, that models eutrophication and uh, nutrients and sediment uh, in lakes and rivers. So coupling those two together, it makes a more robust set of data and a robust um, information on the watershed. So using those... Um, those models, we developed uh, this spill response tool. I'm going to go through some of the steps uh, that, that we did to create this tool, and then I'll give a little demo of the tool. And this is not really something that, uh, that we, you know, want to ever test out. But again, in the, for the sake of preparation, it's something that I think um, water utilities today are inherently thinking about. There was recently um, uh, a derailment in East Palestine, um, Ohio. And so that prompted, there was all over the news, so several uh, train derailments uh, have happened. Both of these on the screen happened since 2023, began 
Uh, so it's not unheard of and preparation is, uh, is essential for that. So what are the steps? Um, I'm gonna go through these one at a time and then each of the, the slides I'll forward will go through uh, each step one at a time. So identify potential sources of contamination, uh, PSOCs. Forgive me for the acronyms, but we're all probably very familiar with, uh, with these or, or others. It's just um, the way we work. Identify contaminants of concerns. Uh, COCs in this case is not chain of custody for our lab folks out there. Uh, and then categorize and classify both of those into a database so that they can then be modeled, used to simulate a spill, creating a user a graphic user interface, and then ultimately uh, developing a spill response plan based on that information, which is sort of outside of the scope of, of this particular talk. So step number one, identifying those uh, potential sources of, of contamination. So according to EPA, any facility or activity that stores, uses, or produces contaminants of concern, which could find their way into source drinking water uh, is a potential source of contamination. So you can see from the map there that these are uh, potential sources of contamination. It could be businesses, they could be uh, railways, they could be uh, industries. Uh, and TCEQ actually developed this as part of um, their source water protection uh, program back in 2010. And they, they approached it from a statewide, you know, really high level um, um, desktop assessment, if you will, uh, of what categorizing these PSOCs and then, and then determining where they are within the state. And they focused really around source waters immediately around source waters, not the entire watersheds. So they called that the uh, the area of primary influence. So again, that was real high level. So in 2018, we recruited, contracted with Plumber to verify uh, states and really dig into um, the data and then enhance it, update it um, with better resolution and expand it to the entire watershed. Uh, and that update included, uh, unlike TCEQ's original assessment, highways, rail lines, pipeline data. So again, uh, going back to 2010, you know, I don't expect you to comprehend everything that's on this table, but this is just something that's on the, the TCEQ's website regarding those potential sources of contaminations. So the, um, the TCEQ identified 227 of these contaminants, and this is wide, widespread across the state, those, those contaminants, they linked to 144 of the, uh, of the sources. So you've got the sources, which are the, uh, could be a plating operation, it could be uh, an industrial facility, it could be some city um, that, that's involved in activities uh, with potential to discharge. But they've linked those two together and they've, they've, they've categorized them broadly as, you'll see on the left-hand side there, businesses and then subcategory of auto parts business. And so within that auto parts business, they've identified these, these um, contaminants that would fall within that business. So that was done again, broad scale across the state, developing a database, what TC, what Plummer did was they took that and started to refine that. Um, they looked at these 227 contaminants and looked at what is the treatability of these? If these were to enter a waterway, how would you treat each of these contaminants <clears throat> for drinking water? Um, what's the volatility of them? And then what's the solubility? And with that data, then we can take that and model it to determine time of travel and, um, and how uh, chemicals might volatilize in water uh, and, and change over time as they enter a creek, enter a lake, enter a river. So the modeling, uh, the contaminants, they use the coupled model, the SWOT and the CEQUAL 
W2, some are considered different flow conditions, and this is based on real time, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in just a second, that real time inflows with uh, USGS gauge stations and then different points of access. So in the case of a, a rail car, um, where does that where does that rail cross a river or where does it cross a lake? Same with highways, same with proximity of, um, of a source to the water. Okay, step four um, was to calibrate uh, a model and they included multiple factors here as far as uh, properties of those chemicals. Was, is the chemical lighter than water? Is it soluble or is it insoluble? Um, if it's heavy and insoluble, it's gonna, it's gonna sink to the bottom where it typically flows in a lake system or a little slower. If it's light, uh, lighter than water density wise, um, it'll stay on the top. Uh, and then uh, if it's soluble, typically uh, it will sort of hang out and disperse within that, uh, somewhere within the water column, depending on temperature, water density, uh, and, and physical properties of that chemical. All right, so now the meat and the potatoes. What, what they did was created a graphic user interface to assimilate the information that, that they had uh, gathered and put into this database. And I'll run through this. It's just some screenshots. Run through this pretty quickly. Um, the first thing that you see on, on the screen is it's, it's graphic user interface. So we've got a map-based application and um, it is able to be used on not only a computer, but on a phone if you're in the field and need to have access uh, as you might in, um, in some kind of an emergency response. So on the, uh, first of all is the map. On the left-hand side, you've got the contaminants, which is the 227 um, uh, contaminants of concern. There's a drop-down box right here, which contains those. And each time you populate that, it will uh, give you information that you can then populate with the time of travel. Uh, it coordinates or um, it gives you the information on real time flows, not necessarily within the lake, but upstream of the lake at each of these gauge stations. Uh, and then some relevant GIS layers that show physical features. So you can see right here, the, uh, the PSOCs uh, or potential sources of contamination are the yellow dots, and then we've added the rails and then the uh, uh, highways as well. So you can, uh, if this were live, you could zoom in and get close proximity to um, determine how far uh, the spill is from the actual water source uh, and from intakes or anything else you're trying to protect. So we'll run through a scenario. It's got a truck that's carrying some uh, trichloroethane it overturns on a highway. You want to figure out how long it's going to take to reach, let's say, the, the dam at Le Mans. So you start out that the 1112 Tetra is um, sort of the default. So you go down, use the drop box, select the contaminant of concern potentially caused in the spill, and then apply that. And it pops up with. Um, information that was that was gathered and put in the database. So you know immediately this is soluble. This is something that's not going to float on the water. Um, it's the two categories that we have are light soluble, which would typically stay a little, uh, I'll say, towards the surface, and soluble. So this is going to mix fairly, rel um, fairly well within the water column. It also gives treatment technologies that can be used or have been shown to be effective based on literature for this particular chemical. 
No. Uh, there's sort of a visual of what I was talking about. So as the plume goes downstream, obviously, you're going to get more dilution. So this graphic just shows, again, the plume going downstream at the point of the spill. It's, it's at its highest. Um, at a, you know, any chosen downstream location, you've got full peak, but you also, the model that they created will, will show half peak and quarter peak. And then as it goes down, downstream, obviously there's going to be more dilution as is shown here. So your full peak is not going to be uh, as much as it is uh, closer to the actual spill itself. Okay, so uh, this is a, a larger screen. It has a scroll bar, so just showing. Um, shows the literature and then other management strategies. Again, we're volatile. Um, or this is a volatile compound, and uh, it's a soluble contaminant. So it just gives a little bit more info on uh, how to manage that. Let's say that we had this spill in the East Arm. Uh, if you're not familiar with with Levon Lake, it's got two major arms, the west arm and the east arm. So we're in the east arm. In an upper reach, there's uh, three reaches that were developed as part of the modeling for this. Uh, they're shown there. And we'll use the middle reach for this model exercise and then take the flows on the east side which are shown in here. And again, that's a real time number. So you would select 100, that's closest to, to 93. And we're dealing with a soluble chemical as shown up here in this box. So click on the travel time button and you get uh, information that's modeled based on those chemical compounds. So again, we're in the east side here, just for reference, the spill takes place uh, up here, I believe the highway uh, 380 is uh, going across just upstream. So zero days, the spill took place, you're at 100% of, uh, of the pollutant is, is present at that point. As it goes down, it's gonna dilute, we'll zoom in here. So if we choose the, um, this 33, 54, 68, what that's showing is that it's going to take 30, based on everything that we know about this chemical, it's going to take approximately 33 days for the quarter peak for you to start seeing a significant amount uh, of this chemical in the water. At this point, 54 days is the half, and then 68 days for full peak. Now, what's important to note here is full peak is not the same as full peak up here as shown in that graph earlier. By the time the model predicts that by the time it gets down to this point, um, dilution will have taken place uh, to the extent that you're only dealing with about 5% of what was full peak down here. And so in the same example, what we've got is it takes um, 73 days for the peak to reach the dam. Now, I'll be the first to say that, you know, everybody's heard the expression, all models are wrong, some are useful. These are scenarios that are, are placed to give, um, to allow managers and decision makers to make decisions based on uh, best available information. This is a first first cut. Anything like this happens, you would have uh, folks on the ground in the water uh, assessing the situation. But this sort of gives you an idea based on what the chemical properties are of the spill of timelines and what you might do uh, to address any kind of a spill and protect the resource. Ran through that pretty quick, but uh, in summary, uh, so this is a growing area, and uh, as it grows, there's going to be greater risk for catastrophic events such as spills. 
<clears throat> modeling these flows does increase our understanding. Just working through that modeling process in and of itself inherently increases our understanding and helps to better prepare responses. And then the graphic tools are, um, I think, very helpful. Thankfully, we haven't had to use any of these and hopefully won't, but they're very helpful in communicating and telling a message of, of what's going on, uh, perhaps in the field. So I'll just finish up by, again, giving kudos and, um, and acknowledging uh, Ernest Toe with Plummer and uh, Ellen McDonald in particular. Uh, there were others in the team too, but uh, Ernest did most of the heavy lifting on this. I think that's it. I don't know if anybody, I can't, it's kind of like Heather, I can't see the chat, but I'll close out of this and see if there's any questions. Anybody have any? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, Robert Spate uh, says, very interesting day, thanks. Jessica Donovan, how often do you have spills to respond to? We rare, you know, most of the spills that, that take place around all of our watersheds are, it's rare. Um, we do occasionally, they usually come through uh, requests from city assistance or notification from TCEQ. Uh, a spill, this sort of uh, tool that I demonstrated is is more to deal with catastrophic spills and uh, knock on wood, I haven't experienced one in my few years here. I don't know that we've had one. Uh, Jet Hayes at uh, Texas GLO says this is pretty neat. I can see a lot of potential uses for this. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I will say I'll follow up on, on Jet's comment, which is, uh, I think it is very useful. There's some good applications for it. I encourage you to reach out to to Plumber if you uh, uh, if you're interested in exploring it in other watersheds. Awesome. Well, all right, um, Dave. Do you mind if I post this video with your presentation? No, I think that's okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That was very very cool. Glad to. All right. So let me see if I can share my screen again. Sharing. Okay. So now everybody should be seeing my presentation screen, correct? Good. Okay, hang on, let me, uh, okay, so um, I kind of moved the order around a little bit to timing here. So, um, so as all of you know, that the Clean Rivers Program is, um, it's administered by the TCEQ and, and they contract with all the planning agencies throughout the basin or throughout the state to uh, administer the program within their basins. Um, our current TCQ project manager is Kieran Freeman. Um, so our technical services and basin planning department is the department that we're in. Um, it is comprised of three major groups, the GIS group, the environmental services group, which we are part of, and we conduct all the, uh, the field work or most of the field work. Um, and then there's the water resources group, which is model development, watershed uh, protection plans, and then also water resource and flood planning groups. Um, so that's just a quick little background on that present or our department. Um, just an update. We uh, are wrapping up the basin highlights report. Um, it is due. The final version of this is due to TCQ on Monday, May 15th. Um, I sent out the link to the presentation or to the report in our invitation letter. So that report is posted on our uh, TRA website. So if you go to the Trinity River Authority website and then you go to Basin Planning and Reports, it'll be there for everyone, everyone to review. 
Um, if you're interested in that, it's broken down like our past reports. Um, it, every every uh, segment is its own chapter, so you don't have to review the entire report just to find out the information that you're interested in. So if you have any comments, questions, revisions that we should make to that, please get those to me by Friday of next week, Friday, May 5th. And the um, format of this report is the what TC calls the standard report format, and that is essentially it's a mini basin summary report. We don't do trend analysis for this report, but we do go into quite a bit of detail about water quality. And so for this report, we're focused on the final version of the 2002 TCQ uh, Texas Integrated Report um, and the date range for this uh, for that um, integrated report was from 2010 to I believe 2020. I added on an additional two years so I can I included data in my basin highlights report up to 2022. And as I mentioned, the chapters are by segment, so you can just go to the ones that you're particularly interested in. Um, just a couple of updates with the integrated report. So if you go to our YouTube channel last year's um, steering committee meeting, I went over the draft 2022 Texas integrated report. So there, um, that'll have a detail if you want to go to that video and just skip to that part of, of the presentation, you can see the detail. Um, these are new listings from the 2020 integrated report to the 22 integrated report. So you can see we have a couple of new bacteria impairments. Um, we have uh, chloride and water impairment in West Fork. Um, the bacteria impairments are in Keechai Creek, Bridgeport, I'm sorry, not Bridgeport, uh, Big Creek, Lacey Fork, North Twin, and Pilot Grove Creeks. And then we also have some, uh, or a DO impairment um, in Grape Creek down around uh, Richland Chambers Reservoir. And all of these impairments, they're currently being covered um, by monitoring that is ongoing, with the exception of the dioxin in segment 808. 808 is a very short segment that is below the dam of Eagle Mountain Reservoir to above the headwaters of uh, Lake Worth. So it's a very small segment. Um, in addition, dioxin is not a parameter that we can sample for to delist. All of that monitoring, I believe, is done by the Texas State Department of Health Services. So that's nothing that we can address with um, Clean Rivers Program routine monitoring. Other than that, all of these new listings are currently being covered by monitoring. We also had a few um, complete delistings, sulfate in water for Lake Livingston, all AUs in, in Lake Livingston, and then also in a, uh, East Fork Trinity River Assessment Unit, unit Number 1. Those were completely removed. Um, and then for the Clear Fork above Weatherford, Segment 833, we also had a delisting there for um, low DO. So I believe that is all that I have. Let me see if I can pull up the chat screen now. Does anybody have any questions? I know we're a little bit ahead of schedule and I'm sure everybody is super bummed about that. Let's see, I'm trying to pull up the participant window, okay. All right, any questions? Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Well, all right, I appreciate everybody. If you do have any questions or had any questions come up for any of the previous presentations, just shoot me an email here and I can forward your question on to the appropriate person. If any of the attendees are sticking around for the coordinated monitoring meeting that starts at 11, I'm actually just gonna leave this presentation, this WebEx running. So if you wanna stay on the line and just go on break for 45 minutes or, um, disconnect and then reconnect to the previous presentation or the previous link you had. Um, it'll still be running. So I thank everybody for showing up today. And again, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. Y'all have a good day. Thank you so much. You too.